welcome everyone. My name is Maria Patsalos. Uh, I'm a partner at Michigan de Rea and I specialize in sports immigration, which is lucky since that's what we're discussing this evening. Um, this is the sixth seminar of eight um, of the Sports Law Academy. It will be recorded and we will share a link to the recording afterwards. People can ask questions during the Q and using the Q&A function, um, and we will take questions at certain points throughout the uh, evening. Um, the format will be around 40 minutes uh, of a presentation for me and my colleague Madney, um, who is an associate in the immigration team, um, and I will introduce him shortly. After that, we will have a Q&A with Charlie McNicholas, who is a senior football intermediary at World in Motion and I will introduce him in more detail in due course. We were also due to be joined by Kevin Beadle, the head of first team recruitment at Cardiff City, but as you can see, he's not on the screen, um, and sadly, he's been called away on an urgent piece of business. So apologies for that, um, but, but um, <laughs> Charlie will more than make up for that. Um, okay, so, as I said, this is gonna be an interactive session. Please do feel free to ask questions um, and we will get to them uh, at some point during uh, uh, the course of this evening. Um, so let's get going. Madney, do you want to um, put up the slides? Should be there now. I can see them, so I think so. Excellent. Um, Yes, so as you can see, um, we're going to be discussing immigration law um, um, in sport in general, but in football in particular. OK, so why do we need sports immigration? I mean, sports is a global business, as we know, and it's capable of hitting front page news in every language and every uh, newspaper across the world, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks with the uh, uh, infamous Super League, which we'll talk about uh, later, I'm sure, during the Q&A. Um, it's, it's huge. It's a huge industry. Um, as the slide says, it's worth more than 3% of the world trade um, in 2019. Um, it, it would have increased and then probably decreased as a result of COVID, but, but, but you get the idea. Um, and it's 3.7% of the combined um, GMP of, of the 28 EU member states. It's been valued at 407 billion euros um, and it employs a, a good chunk of the EU labour force. Um, live television rights, as we all know, are, are huge. Um, for the uh, Premier League for 2019 to 22, they were around 5 billion if we do include Amazon's fee, which um, has, has more recently been disclosed and in fact today it was in the press um, that this um, the television rights have been extended for another two to three years um, potentially and they've been extended for the same amount which is really really important it means that there's not going to be a bidding war um, it means that the Premier League clubs are going to have the same income um, for, for a number of years to come um, increase in transfer fees Again, astronomical figures that we're looking at here. Um, most expensive uh, Premier League signing at the moment is still Paul Pogba at 89 million. Um, we've got Lukaku up there with 76 million. Um, and, and we've got um, Pulisic there on 57 million as the most expensive American player. Probably said that wrong as well. Um, <laughs> so you, you get the idea. Um, sports immigration is is obviously um, uh, uh, very important as a result of all of those things. It, it, it's players and um, uh, travel and 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 play uh, in different countries, and that's where we come in. Um, the immigration group at Michigan um, have been working in this area for a number of years, uh, and we help uh, agents, clubs, um, uh, sports stars themselves. Um, and it's um, it's something that we're very passionate about as as huge sports fans as well. Um, okay, so this is what we're going to be discussing today. First of all, the plain vanilla sports routes, um, which have changed hugely uh, since Brexit, and Madney will be talking us through that. Uh, then I will be talking about the family routes um, with a, a small example of, of, of a Mishkon way of doing things. Um, and finally, of course, we have to discuss Brexit uh, in its own right. Um, so I think that's me done, and I'm going to be handing over to Madney now to take us through all the different sports routes. Thank you, Maria. So the tier two sports person visa is the home office's immigration category for internationally established elite sports people and coaches. The visa is open for a number of professional sports, including Aikido, canoeing, 
wrestling, and of course, football. Interestingly enough, yoga is also on the list. So a yogi with sufficient experience may just get this visa. To qualify for a tier two sports person visa, the applicant must, one, make a significant contribution to the development of their sport in the UK, base themselves in the UK, be from outside the UK and the common travel area. The common travel area, for those who don't know, is an arrangement between the UK and the Crown Dependencies, Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, and Ireland. This predates membership of the EU and is not dependent upon it. And they have to satisfy the English language requirements. For instance, by passing an English language test at level A1, a beginner level, or being from a majority English speaking country, for example, the USA, New Zealand, Australia, some Caribbean countries such as Jamaica, St. Lucia, or they can have a degree that was taught in English. We understand that a tier two sports person visa will be rebranded later this year to the international sports person visa. So the process. To obtain a tier two sports person visa, the applicant has to go through a number of steps, which we will explore in the following slides. As a summary, however, first, the applicant has to be sufficiently qualified. The requirements to be sufficiently qualified are set by each sports governing body. For football, that's the FA. The applicant sponsor then applies for a governing body endorsement. The governing body assesses the applicant to see if they are internationally established to the requisite level. If so, the sponsor, for instance, a football club, is issued with a governing body endorsement for that specific applicant. The applicant sponsor must hold an A-rated sponsor license. A sponsor license is essentially authorization from the Home Office that the company can sponsor foreign individuals to work in the UK. Unless they've been naughty, the majority of football clubs that hold a sponsor license will be A-rated sponsors. The club will then use the governing body endorsement, the GBE, to apply for and assign a certificate of sponsorship within three months. The certificate of sponsorship, a COS, is essentially an electronic work permit. It confirms the applicant's personal details, their job duties, salary, and where they will be sponsored to work. Once the COS is assigned to the applicants, they can submit their formal tier two sports person visa application. So governing bodies. Using a football example, the governing body for football in England is the English Football Association. They will only provide their governing body endorsements to clubs in the Premier and Football League. The footballer must satisfy certain playing criteria to qualify for a GBE. As Maria mentioned, these GBE criteria changed following Brexit. As you'll see in the following slides, players can qualify for a GBE depending on their international appearances. This is similar to the pre-Brexit position. Following Brexit, players can also now qualify based on how many minutes they have played in, in their domestic and continental competitions, the final league position and continental progression of their last club, and the league quality of their last club. This is in comparison to the pre-Brexit system, which focused on transfer fees and salaries alongside stricter criteria for minutes played for the player's last club. Compared to the old system, there are now more ways to earn the required points to qualify for a GBE. Following Brexit, EU and non-EU players alike will fall under the same system. Previously, players with European citizenship did not require any form of permission to work in the UK. International appearances. A footballer will need 15 points to qualify for a GBE. In the first instance, the FA will assess the player's international appearances at a senior level and their country's FIFA World Ranking. If the footballer has played in a sufficient number of matches, they may qualify for an auto pass, i.e. they're granted a GBE automatically. If not, they'll be allocated between 10, 0 and 10 points, depending on their number of appearances. The reference period to calculate the number of appearances is the 12 months immediately before the application for a GBE. So if we applied for a GBE today, the FA would consider the number of international matches a footballer has played since 28 April 2020. For example, if Christian Eriksen was to return to the Premier League and needed sponsorship, as he plays a majority of the games for Denmark, and because they are currently ranked 10th in the FIFA rankings, he would obtain an auto pass. Whereas if players such as Eric Bailly or Serge Aurier required a GBE, depending on the, despite playing a majority of their international games for the Ivory Coast, because the Ivory Coast is only ranked 59, they would only obtain one or two points. 
Although international appearances are important, it's not a deal breaker if the footballer isn't featuring in their national team. The 15 point threshold. If a player does not automatically qualify on the basis of their international appearances, they can make up the shortfall and reach the 15 point threshold by considering other factors. These include their club appearances, for instance, the minutes in domestic and con continental competitions, the quality of their club, for instance, the league quality of the player's current club, the domestic league position and progression in continental competitions at the end of last season for the player's last club. The terminology current club and last club reflect the fact that a footballer may have played for a different club in the previous season and so their achievement should be evidenced accordingly. If they were playing for the same club, we consider the same points, but just for the current club. Quality of competitions. The FA has categorized domestic and international, uh, domestic leagues and international competitions into bands. The higher the band, the more points players earn. As you can see, the top division leagues of England, Germany, Spain, Italy, and France are deemed to be the highest quality leagues. As you go down the ladder, we have some interesting additions. Band three includes the top division Brazilian, Mexican, and Argentinian leagues, which should make it easier to get work permits for players from those regions. However, the second division leagues in Germany, Spain, and France are in band four. And for some reason, Italy's second division is nowhere to be seen. Historically, championship and lower division clubs scouted and signed players from these leagues. Their banding being so low will almost certainly result in fewer European players from the second division leagues being signed. The FA would arguably consider this a good thing as it should in turn promote local talents. Regarding continental competitions, as the Copa Libertadores is a band one continental competition, this alongside the South American leagues being in band three will almost certainly result in more South American players being signed by English teams. Domestic minutes, getting into the nitty gritty now. This table reflects the points that players will earn depending on the minutes they have played in the club's domestic league. Similar to the reference period for international appearances, the reference period to calculate domestic minutes is based on the 12 months immediately before the application for a GBE. In calculating the domestic minutes, if a footballer was unavailable for selection, for instance, due to injury or suspension, those minutes played by his club when he was unavailable would not be considered. Only the minutes where the footballer was available for selection will count towards the calculation. For example, if a team played 900 minutes during the reference period, but the footballer was only available for 720 of those minutes due to injury, the FA would only consider how many of those 720 minutes he played. In respect of banding, a footballer who has played roughly 50% of minutes in Spain's top division will earn eight points to record to, towards the required 15. But if they had played the same number of minutes in the Brazil's top division, they would only earn four points. In practice, this distribution of points and domestic bans means that players who are regularly starting in Europe in the top league should have no problem earning points for a GBE. Continental minutes. The same principle of, of available minutes and the 12 month reference period applies here. Regular starters for Champions League and Copa Libertadores clubs will earn a comfortable amount of points. In combination with the points earned by their domestic league, footballers playing regularly for such clubs can quite rapidly earn the required 15 points for a GBE. Understandably, as the quality of a competition and minutes played are reduced, the amount of points earned are reduced. Domestic league quality. Footballers can also earn points for the domestic league quality of their current club. A player simply has to play in at least one domestic or continental match day squad or play at least 1% of a club's domestic minutes to earn these points. As you'll note from the table, players can earn a massive amount of points for not doing much other than being in a match day squad. Ultimately, as a result of this, obtaining a GBE for players of Europe's top leagues should be a trivial exercise. Indeed, squad players, rotation players, those out of favour and those up and coming prospects can all earn 12 out of the required 15 points just for being named in the match day squad. Footballers can also earn points depending on where their last club finished in their domestic league. Again, the threshold to earn these points is extremely low as they only have to play in one day, one match day squad 
or a period 1% of the club's domestic cup minutes. Lastly, if the player's last club was playing in a continental competition and they paired in at least one match day squad, the footballer can also earn points depending on how far their last club progressed. The further they progress, the more points they'll earn. Regarding youth players, those who are under the age of 21 when the GBE is applied for can also earn points using the aforementioned system. However, if they do not reach the required 15-point threshold, the FA has an additional set of criteria that can be relied solely upon youth players. These are more reflective of where a youth player might be in their career and include if the youth player has made their debut for the senior team, at a youth level, their international appearances, at a youth level, their youth clubs, their youth club's final league position, continental progression and league quality. There are some restrictions which prevent earning points for areas of overlap. For example, a player will only be granted the higher of the points he is eligible for under the domestic minutes played criteria against the senior club debut criteria. Moving on to the exceptions panel. If the footballer is internationally established and they obtain the required 15 points, the GBE will be issued. However, if the player falls short of the 15 points, the club may be able to appeal to the exceptions panel. The exceptions panel essentially allows clubs to try and earn a GBE, even if the player hasn't obtained the required 15 points. One recent notable example of a player obtaining a GBE for the exception panel is Aston Villa's Douglas Louise. He failed to obtain a GBE when signed by Manchester City. After he went on loan to Girona and due to the rules at the time, he qualified for a GBE via the exceptions panel when Aston Villa signed him. As the rules currently stand, the exceptions panel closed from the end of, Jan from the end of a January 2021 transfer window. However, there are rumours that it may yet live on. So for your information only in a historical context, players who earned between 10 and 40 points could apply to the exceptions panel. The panel consisted of three people, one legally qualified chair and two individuals with experience at a high level in the game. The exceptions panel only made a positive recommendation if there were exceptional circumstances that prevented the player from earning 15 points. For example, if the player suffered an injury which meant he could not play the sufficient number of matches. Whereas for youth players, the scope is a bit more subjective as the exceptions panel judged if the player had significant potential and if they were of sufficient quality. If the exceptions panel made a positive recommendation, the FA had discretion to grant a GBE. Ultimately, the FA retained the discretion and could still refuse a GBE despite the exceptional panel's exceptions panel approval. Despite the abundance of ways to earn points, this is why it's critical to start considering the impact of the new GBE requirements as soon as a potential signing has been identified. So, once the GBE is issued, the football club will assign a certificate of sponsorship, the work permit, to the player. The player then applies for the visa from their home country or any country where they have a right to reside. In light of the COVID pandemic, the Home Office has also been accepting discretionary applications from inside the UK when individuals are usually required to apply for entry clearance. If approved, the visa will be issued for three years or the length of the contract, whatever is shorter. This can then be extended for another three years. As part of the sponsor duties, the club must notify the Home Office if any details on the certificate of sponsorship change, for example, a salary increase or a change of work location. After living in the UK for five years with a tier two sports person visa, the player can apply to settle in the UK. This is known as indefinite leave to remain. If successful, they will be free of immigration restrictions and will no longer require sponsorship to work in the UK. One year after obtaining ILR, indefinite leave to remain, the player can then apply to naturalise as British. As part of a tier two sports person visa, players can apply to bring their immediate family, spouse, their children, to the UK as their dependents. They will satisfy, satisfy maintenance requirements to confirm they will not rely on public funds, but the clubs can certify this for the player and their family as part of a tier two sports person visa. So for players moving on loan, where authorised by the FA, players can move on loan to another club. If loaned to an English club, they must be in the Premier or Football League. 
if loaned from an English club to a club affiliated with the Scottish or Welsh FA, that club would have to satisfy the Scottish or Welsh FA's GBE criteria for the loan player. To confirm, the recipient club does not need to hold a sponsor license to loan a player. Overseas loans are permitted, but in all cases, the club must notify the Home Office of the loan and they must still maintain overall responsibility for the player. When the player returns, as long as the GBE in course remain valid, the club would not have to apply for another GBE. For example, if a player with a five-year contract is sent on loan in year three, at the end of that year, he would need a new GBE because, as you mentioned earlier, the GBE is only valid for a maximum of three years. Accordingly, on return to his parent club, he would need to be assessed again and apply for a new GBE. If the player is loaned from an overseas club, for example, Arsenal's Odegaard, that player would need to satisfy all the same GBE requirements at that we have discussed so far. So another category where they may be, may be to apply for a visa, sports person visa is the tier five temporary or working, temporary working creative or sporting visa. So if a player does not qualify for a tier two sports person visa, they can try to get through using this system. Similarly, this is for sports people at the highest level or those who will make a significant contribution to development and operation of that sport in the UK. Suit to be qualified coaches may also qualify. As with, tier two, as with the tier two sports person visa, applicants must be from outside the UK and the common travel area. One critical advantage of this visa compared to the tier two visa is that there is, that there is no English language requirements. This means that players who haven't quite reached the level of English required for tier two can apply under this route. As per tier two, the applicant must be endorsed by this sports governing body and must then, must then be sponsored by their club. The applicant can also bring their dependent family with them, but unlike tier two, the club cannot certify maintenance for the family members. Importantly, the player cannot change clubs inside the UK. They must leave and make a fresh visa application from outside the UK if switching clubs. A tier five visa is only granted for 12 months or the length of the contract, whichever is shorter. The visa can then be extended for another 12 months. Applicants cannot be on this visa for more than two years and this route does not lead to indefinite leave to remain. Interestingly, individuals with a visitor visa can in certain circumstances switch to tier five from inside the UK. Usually, the Home Office do not permit switching from visitor visas. Once they satisfy the English language requirement, they can switch from Tier 5 to Tier 2 inside the UK. We understand that Tier 5 will likely be fused with the International Sports Person Visa later this year, and the requirements are likely, large, are likely to be largely the same. So, lastly from me, a quick comparison of the Tier 2 and Tier 5 routes. As you'll note, there are a few critical differences, such as the length of the visa and administrative processes, which make the tier, which makes tier two the better option. However, some applicants will have to apply under tier five if they cannot satisfy the English language requirements. Maria will take it forward from here. Great, thank you, Madney. Let me just share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so before I, I talk about um, uh, the, the visit visas for sports people, uh, just a couple of points in relation to what madney has been uh, discussing, which is the, the tier two and tier five. Um, you know, we've had we've had a lot of changes that have just been introduced for the January transfer window. Um, and it, it, even before the changes came in, this area of work is is you know, is limited to the transfer windows for football. Um, and therefore it can be very stressful um, working out all the different points um, allocation and working out whether someone can in fact be uh, brought to the UK. Um, um, and the variables, as Madney mentioned, um, the, um, uh, the FIFA World Rankings are really important. And so there have been a, a couple of occasions where we've kind of been working all the way till midnight because um, at midnight the FIFA World Rankings were going to change uh, and the country um, that we were, um, the, the uh, player that um, whose country we were working for, um, they didn't do too well in, in, in a recent cup and they were just about to drop down the rankings and then they wouldn't be 
be eligible um, to apply. So, you know, these things are really important and time sensitive. Um, so so just wanted to add uh, that. And um, thank you to everyone who's uh, putting some questions in the Q&A. Uh, we've answered a couple already, um, but there's one question from... Lee, um, who says this seems to apply only to men's football. Has the policy and process been worked out for women's football? And, and the answer is yes, Lee. Um, there are equivalent rules for, for women's football um, and they're, they're all on the Home Office website um, and they're, they're, they're broadly the same, um, but, but different points and different allocations. Um, but, but yes, and those change, those the women's rules also changed um, for the January transfer window post-Brexit. Um, Jack, we haven't forgotten about you. I see that you've asked a question and we're going to uh, wait uh, till the panel discussion to answer your question because it's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, so, OK, carrying on with the slides and please do keep the questions coming as as we go along. Um, so. Of course, people, uh, sports people come to the UK under the visit visa route um, as well. Um, and, and this is the general visit visa rule. Um, and they come to uh, participate in specific sports related events or activities. Of course, we've got the Euros coming up this summer. A lot of sports people will be coming in under this category, um, which is absolutely permitted. Um, they are allowed to attend a trial, not in front of an audience, um, play in a tournament such as the Euros as I just said, or um, they can come to the UK to negotiate a contract or sponsorship deal. Um, we've uh, I've had uh, various inquiries from, from clubs before about uh, players coming in, um, and, and I always kind of quote this bit of the rules, as long as they're attending a trial, not in front of an audience, um, and they said, oh, well, there'll be a few people there, um, and, and, you know, they'll pay a, a small fee to watch. And I said, no, that's not permissible under this route. Um, so, so the visit visa route is one that is often... Um, uh, used incorrectly uh, because there are so many people that can come into the UK without even applying for a visit visa because they are what's known as visa-free nationals, such as Americans, for example, um, and now European nationals. Um, so there is a lot of scope for um, misusing this route. So um, we'll talk about it a little bit more um, as we move on. Um, it's also for support staff and officials, of course, working at sporting events. Um, and, and of course, it's for people outside of the UK and the common travel area. Um, so let's see if I can move along. Yes. So a sports person cannot be paid under this route. Um, they can only accept payment in the form of prize money and expenses for, for travel and accommodation. Um, so The most amount of the, the sports people that use this route the most are are darts players and snooker players, um, and they come in um, in order to you know uh, play in competitions um, and and often they will will come in reg fairly regularly um, over the course of a year uh, and they can get caught out on this visa and I'll give an example of that in a minute um, if they want to extend their stay or undertake paid work they can apply from a visit visa to a tier five visa um, which is unusual for the immigration rules because usually you cannot um, switch from a visit visa to any other visa however the home office has been extremely um, flexible due to COVID and they have allowed various switching and um, uh, allowed people to stay beyond their visas because of COVID and the inability to travel um, because various countries have, have locked down and not allowed people to travel from the UK. So there's been lots of flexibility more recently, but generally th this is the rule. Also, um, under the visit visa rule, a sports person cannot bring their family members with them unless they also apply for a visit visa and come under that route. Um, they must be able to maintain and accommodate themselves without recourse to public funds. What does that mean? It basically means they have to have a healthy bank balance. Um, and, and often with a visit visa application, uh, the sports person will need to submit uh, their bank statements for the last three to six months and they need to show that healthy bank balance. Um, and if they are not applying for a visa because they're American, European, etc., they may need to show a border officer that they do have enough money in their account uh, by, by looking at their phone, etc. 
Okay, so this is where it gets tricky for a sports person who's coming in as a visitor. They can only stay for a maximum of six months in any 12 month period. Now, what does that mean? It, it does not mean that you can come to the UK for six months, go to Paris for a day, and then come back to the UK and reset your six month clock. It does not work like that. A lot of people do think it works like that and they get caught out. And this is what I was saying before about sport, um, darts and snooker players. I've been uh, called um, on an emergency where I've had a, a client at the border at Heathrow and they said they're not letting me in. Um, and I said, why not? Um, and, and, and he said that, um, that, you know, I've, I've spent too, too long in the UK. And, and it turned out that he'd been breaching this route, uh, this rule. Um, and, and he'd been spending more than six months in the UK, only going out for a month or two and then coming back in. And it doesn't work like that. It's any six month period in, in, in any 12 month period. Um, and it doesn't have to be consecutive. It can be cumulative. So it's a tricky one. Um, and um, th they cannot be seen to be living in the UK through frequent six month visits. So, for example, if they're staying in the UK for, you know, six months and, and they're staying in France for three months and Spain for three months, then the, the majority of their time they're actually spending in the UK. So they're probably living here. So it, it needs to be carefully managed, especially when traveling through the border to explain the position to the immigration officer. Um, they must have an intention to leave, of course, that's part of the visa. Um, they can apply for a long term visit visa if they can prove uh, they need to make repeat visits over a long period. So, for example, um, th the maximum um, a, a, a visa can be granted is 10 years. So where they can prove that they need to come in and out regularly for, uh, over the 10 year period or likely they'll get a 10 year visa versus a five year a two year, a one year and a six month visa. Those are the, the, the options. OK, um, as I said, this is in relation to the switching. Um, it is possible to switch um, from a sports person visitor into a tier five visa, but it's not possible to, to switch into a tier two visa. Again, these rules may have been relaxed during COVID, but certainly that's the position. Um, and a sports person can only switch to a tier five visa um, on a from a visit visa if the certificate of sponsorship was assigned before entry. Now, this is really important because we've had clients where, um, where you know, they've got caught out with this. Um, it's Clubs always want footballers to be in as soon as possible. They want them in yesterday. They want them training with the team. They want them, you know, traveling for um, pre-season friendlies, uh, all of that. So, so we need to be really careful here because they'll often get the player to come in as a visitor to undertake a medical, to, to sign the contract, and then they'll want them to get going straight away, assuming all of that goes swimmingly. However, um, if they do not assign, if the club does not assign the certificate of sponsorship before they travel to the UK as a visitor, the player will need to go back to their home country to apply for the visa and come back. And that obviously takes time. The club is not happy. The player is not happy. So this is a really good workaround. Um, whether we know whether the medical is going to go well or they're going to sign the contract or not, um, the club needs to assign a certificate of sponsorship um, just in case it works out and then the player will be able to switch as soon as everything's signed from the UK without having to, to travel back home. OK, so moving on to the family routes, there are a few family route options. So this is for players who are lucky and don't need to apply um, under the sports routes um, if they meet any of the requirements under the family routes. So this is uh, the ancestry visa. Um, it's most commonly used by rugby and cricket players for, for obvious reasons, and that's because um, they, they must be from a Commonwealth country um, and they must be able to prove that one of their grandparents was born in the UK. Uh, and of course, that's very common for South Africans, Australians, Kiwis, etc. Um, so um, the, the other thing to note is com the Commonwealth is actually far larger than you can imagine. Um, it's not just the obvious countries. There are um, a lot, a lot of countries in the Commonwealth. So um, a lot more players can potentially benefit from this route um, than, than you may think. Um, 
Again, that magic line of they must be able to maintain and accommodate themselves without recourse to public funds. They also must have a healthy bank balance. Um, the beauty of this visa is that they can switch employer, um, i.e. club, um, um, without changing their visa. They're free to, to play for whoever they want because uh, subject to contract, of course, um, because the ancestry visa is not linked to their employment. It's linked to their family uh, background. Um, so it, it, and it's obviously it's a work visa. Um, it, the, the sports person, in order to apply for this visa, must be able to prove that they can work in the UK, although they don't have to have signed a contract yet. What do we mean by this? Um, they, they, you know, they need to be of playing age, um, but they don't need to have anything locked in for, for certain. Um, they can bring family members with them. That's the beauty of this visa. And the other beauty of the visa is it's a five year visa. It's a really long, long visa. And at the end of the five years, they're eligible for ILR, indefinite leave to remain or settlement. Um, and, and after holding ILR for one year, they can apply uh, to naturalise as British. So it's a fantastic visa um, if, if a sports person can qualify for this um, because of all the reasons on this slide. It's a five year visa. They can work for any uh, club. Uh, and they can bring their family with them. Okay, another route. So if a sports person is married to a British person or a settled person, now a settled person means someone who has ILR, indefinite leave to remain. Um, so then the, the, the person, the sports person can then apply to join them or travel with them to the UK. There is an English language requirement um, as with tier two, and the English language requirement is higher here than tier two. Um, and so that could be prohibitive for some people, um, but um, it's, it's slightly higher. Um, here, the visa is granted for two and a half years and then extended for a further two and a half years. Again, once they meet the magic number of five years, they can apply for ILR. There is a, 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 a minimum income threshold for this visa, uh, which makes it slightly tricky for some people. Um, and that is that the, the British or settled partner um, must earn £18,600 or if they have a child who is not British, because if the child is British, then they don't need to accommodate for them in this uh, rule. Um, but if the child is not British, then that goes up to 22,400 and an additional 2,400 for any additional non-British child. Um, so just to clarify, what we're saying is that the British or settled spouse or partner um, must either earn 18,600 or um, with the additions if they have children. Alternatively, they must have savings of 62,500 um, if they don't have children and it goes up if they do. Now, this is important because a lot of sports people's spouses or partners do not work and therefore they do not they are not eligible um, for the minimum income threshold of 18,600 um, and then you ha have scenarios where the club turns around and say that's fine we'll just give her um, uh, 62 and a half thousand um, uh, pounds and then we'll get the deal going um, but but that doesn't work because the 62 and a half thousand needs to have been held for six months and obviously uh, the player is needed before then um, so so this can be a little tricky um, um, and the sports person income obviously will not count at the entry stage, which is why we're discussing the spouse's income. But there is a possible solution here. Um, if you bring in the sports person under tier five, assuming they meet the tier five criteria, um, then you can switch them in country to the spouse or partner visa. And then at the switching stage, you can rely on the sports person's earnings. Um, so this is just a little workaround if, if that works. Um, again, this is un unrestricted working rights. So it means that if you have a player who is um, the spouse or partner of a settled person, then they can play for any club um, and, and they're not uh, linked um, in relation to um, uh, the rules for tier two and tier five. Okay, so if the sports person is a partner of an EEA national, then, th then there's some options here as well. But because of Brexit, these are slightly more limited now. So as it says on the slide, um, if the sports person was a partner of an EA national and that EA national was living in the UK before the 31st of December uh, 2020, just gone, then they can apply for a family permit valid for six months. So that's an EU settlement scheme family permit. 
Um, then they can enter the UK and apply under the settlement scheme for pre-settled status, uh, which will be given to them for five years. And at the end of that, they can apply for settled status. If they are not married, they need to be able to show that they were in a durable relationship by the 31st of December. Um, and this usually means evidencing that they've been living together for a number of years, around two years, uh, or they have children um, to show that they, they, they're in a durable relationship. So, again, once the sports person is here, they apply for a pre-settled status visa, which is valid for five years. Again, unrestricted working rights, and then, then they can apply for settled status, which is the equivalent of ILR after five years. Um, now, with this one and the, the previous one about the uh, British spouse or the settled spouse, I've had scenarios where clients have said to me, um, you know, you know I'm a player, I'm going to come to the UK, um, but my spouse is going to remain in France, for example. Um, and, and, and that doesn't work. Uh, they can only rely on, on coming um, under the EA rules or the spouse rules if the spouse is in the UK. It seems obvious, but apparently not to everyone. Um, so they can't rely on these rules unless the spouse is, is going to be moving to the UK too. Okay. So, British citizenship. So um, it's really important for sports people to, to consider their rights to ILR, settled status and citizenship. Um, so when they're in the UK for uh, coming up to their fourth year, uh, especially, you know, the, and planning for the for the four to six year stage, they really need to think about um, how their contracts, loans or transfers are structured, because this could determine their ability to secure ILR or citizenship going forward. Um, and this is really important because once they have that, that status, they can play for anyone without restriction. Um, and this is really important because this occurred in one transfer uh, a, a few years back where we ended up, um, we had a player who was who had fallen out with the manager, wasn't getting selected and he, he wanted to leave. And he had an offer from a club in Europe. And, and we said to him, you know, you're, you're almost there. You're almost at the ILR stage. So, you know, I know you're upset. Don't leave, you know, yet. Why don't we arrange you to go on a loan for a year? Because then you're still technically uh, working for the parent club um, when it comes to immigration um, and you can still apply for ILR and citizenship. So that's how we did it. We structured the deal as a loan rather than a transfer, which is what the, the player initially wanted. Um, and, and he was able to benefit from that because once you get ILR and citizenship, um, as I said, uh, the player can play for any club. And, and also the important thing about citizenship uh, as well is they can go and play overseas and then come back um, and play in the UK later because you can't lose citizenship in the same way that you can lose ILR. Uh, you can lose ILR if you're outside of the UK for two more than two years in a row. Um, and, and for European nationals now settled status, if they're outside for more than five years, they can lose that. So, you know, it is important to consider these things because after players have gone through uh, the rigmarole of, of getting their status, ILR or settled status, they don't want to lose it. So it's important to have these things in mind. Okay. Right. OK, so this is um, uh, probably one of my proudest moments, actually, <laughs> as a lawyer. We came up with something uh, quite unique. Um, and this is where um, we, along with the, you know, in the sports immigration team, we came up with the first ever football investor visa. Um, and I say first ever because it was also the last ever, um, as it was uh, shortly uh, removed from the rules uh, after that. So, yes, I, I'm very proud of this because um, I managed to change the immigration rules. Um, so uh, effectively what it was, um, as Madney explained at the start, most sports people um, come in under the sports routes, the tier two and tier five routes, unless they have any of the family options available to them. Um, and we thought, well, hang on, why don't we look at the investor visa? The investor visa is for high net worth individuals, which, of course, footballers are. Um, and it allows um, a, a, it would allow a, a player to play for any club, just like the partner routes um, do the family routes. 
Um, so we, we, we spoke to a, a top Premier League club um, who had a South American footballer in mind. Um, and we went through the process and we got um, him the first ever um, investor visa for a footballer by working with um, uh, a bank and, um, and getting that all set up. And so you know, it was it was really fantastic. And we thought this is going to be a good alternative um, to uh, the family routes, which also do not need the sponsorship that Magni discussed. However, the FA did not like this. Um, they had other ideas. Uh, they thought that we were trying to or the footballers were trying to circumvent their rules. Um, and although we tried to explain that, you know, uh, someone who's married to a British citizen or an EU national were also able to circumvent their rules legitimately, um, it, they, they didn't agree. So um, the rules were changed and this route is no longer available. Um, but as I said, um, uh, very proud of, uh, of this. <laughs> um, OK. We can't talk about immigration without talking about Brexit, sadly. Um, and we have been talking about this for a number of years. And finally, we can say now that we have officially Brexited, as you know, um, 31st of December 2020, this occurred. Um, and now the UK immigration rules treat all EA nationals and non-EA sports people in the same way. Um, so all of those rules that Madney said at the start um, will be the same for European, uh, European sports people as well now. Um, but if we have any um, EA sports people in the UK, they need to take immediate steps to secure their, their position in the UK post-Brexit um, because there are deadlines coming up. Um, as long as the sports person was in the UK by 31st of December, and this can mean they just flew in as long as they have evidence that they flew in before the 31st of December um, and that they were, um, you know, in the UK, um, they can apply for pre-settled status. But they have to do that by the 30th of June. This is the, cut, the, the deadline. Um, and if they were in the UK for at least five years uh, before the 30th, um, if they've been in the UK for five years, they can apply for settled status again by the 30th of June. Now, up until very recently, the Home Office were being very strict with this. And we had various questions um, whereby um, they they were being questioned as to how strict they were going to be on these rules. And they said, absolutely, we're going to be super strict. No one can, can pass this date. But in the last week or so, they've relaxed that. And they've said, if there are compassionate reasons why someone cannot meet this 30th of June date, then there are going to be um, some exemptions. So that's good to know. OK. All right. So let's have a look where we are with the questions. Um, and then we can hopefully move on to um, our panel discussion. Okay, all right. So Biola has asked, does the criteria remain the same for foreign cric cricketers to take part in county cricket? Are they eligible to apply for tier two, tier five or just visitor? Um, yes. The rules for all sports changed um, uh, due to Brexit in, in January. So each governing body would have changed their rules. Um, um, but, but yes, they will be eligible under uh, all of those visa categories. And you need to just check uh, online uh, on the Home Office website in relation to um, the, the uh, governing body um, criteria for that. OK, so um, let's bring in. Uh, panelists. So I'm going to stop sharing. Here we go. And if I could ask Madney and Charlie, yet yeah, brilliant on cue. Excellent. So let me just, where are we here? My, I can't exit my, oh, here we go. Excellent. Brilliant. Uh, Charlie, you're there as well. Brilliant. OK, so we, before we proceed, I'm just going to um, introduce Charlie and then have Charlie introduce 
himself and what what he does um, so that the the audience um, can can field appropriate questions to him so since joining world in motion charlie has assembled a client list featuring premier league and championship players charlie is fluent in three foreign languages uh, which is very impressive i'm trying to learn one right now and it's very difficult um, enabling him this enables him to play an integral role in the company's overseas division which is great because we're going to be discussing scouting and things like that um, in relation to the immigration piece. In recent years, Charlie has brokered a number of deals at clubs, both in the English Premier League and Spain's top division, La Liga. So welcome, Charlie. Um, please do kind of introduce yourself. Tell us about, um, uh, you know, what your day to day role is and, and, and yeah, just let the audience know um, what you do. Thank you, Maria, for that flattering introduction. I might have written that myself, I think. <laughs> Uh, I'm an agent for a company called World in Motion. So we're a multi-sport agency, but I work in the football department and um, I've been working there for 10 years. We've been trading in football for, well, since the late nineties really. And we represent over 200 players, I'd say, across most major leagues. So certainly Premier League, Bundesliga and Serie A, I can think of. And, and I guess that the core of our job is player representation and negotiating their contracts and transfers. It goes a bit further than that. We, we manage their commercial interests, you know, endorsements and sponsorships, things like that, dealing with uh, kit manufacturers and brands. And really, we, we try to do everything for them to enable them just to focus on the pitch. So. We make sure they're in safe hands as regards, you know, financial planning, property, um, and just the general running of their day-to-day -day lives. Brilliant, excellent. So we've got we've got one question from Jack at the moment, but please do um, keep them rolling in. Um, I'm just going to ask a few questions first before we come to your question, Jack. Um, so you know, we've obviously discussed Brexit quite a lot during our presentation. Um, have you seen any kind of major changes in relation to scouting practices um, and things like that as a result of Brexit? Yeah, we have done. I mean, the, the new regulations came in out of nowhere right before, just on the eve of the January window. So it didn't really give clubs that much time to kind of plan or overhaul their scouting methods or strategies I think we'll see a big shift in terms of where clubs recruit players from in the sort of longer term I think um, you know it was very simple previously for clubs to just go and poach a player from another EU nation and now it isn't that clear cut and I think there are other very strong football countries that come into the equation so there's band two countries like Turkey and Portugal um, that are going to find it quite easy to get players into England, maybe easier bef than before in the case of Turkey. And in band three, you have Brazil and Argentina, who obviously have a huge footballing tradition. But previously, it was very difficult to move a player to the UK from those two countries if they didn't have a European passport. And now that's out of the equation and it's more a case it's more performance related. And if they're playing regularly in those leagues, they are eligible to now come and play in England. So it's quite exciting and it's gonna take time for clubs to get their heads around it. And I think it's gonna take a bit more time because of the pandemic as well and clubs not being able to reach those countries like Brazil and Argentina to scout players. But there's value for money in those markets. And instead of shopping in Segunda in Spain or Bundesliga 2 in Germany. It's now very difficult to buy players from those leagues, but it's a lot easier to go to Argentina and get a good young striker. So I think as soon as we're able to travel and scout players live, we will see a shift in where clubs are scouting and where they're choosing to recruit players from. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned COVID. Um, obviously, that's that's had a huge impact on 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 football in every sense. Um, but we didn't see much activity in the January transfer window um, as a result. Do you think that that's going to change in this summer window? I think there's a little bit of apprehension, you know, within the industry about how the next few windows will pan out. Um, certainly, if I was a club, 
maybe now would not be the time to be spending big amounts of money, you know, just purely looking at the sort of finances and the losses that some clubs have incurred. I think football will be okay. And you touched on it there. And certainly in the UK, if we are able to um, replicate the TV deal that we've had for the last few years, I think that's a great result. And I think that gives clarity to clubs down the football pyramid to know what their revenue and what's be coming in from broadcasting over the next few years. But I do think we will see a bit of an impact on the market in the next few years and clubs being a bit more cautious. I think we'll see more kind of low risk, short term deals, season long loans, um, player exchanges, clubs not wanting to expose themselves to big transfer fees on players that they don't know too well that might not adjust or adapt and settle in because I just think they, they, they can't afford to at the moment. Yeah, no, uh, that's really interesting. Um, we're, we're obviously missing our, our footballing uh, panellists. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this question because uh, we all have an opinion on it and I can give mine as well um, in relation to, you know, do we think that the new rules are, are, are a good thing? Do we think that it's beneficial for, uh, you know, the, the English youth players, for example, um, looking to, to, to make it through the ranks and, and hopefully, you know, win us the World Cup one day, uh, hopefully. Um, do you, what, what's your sense? from the clubs and and you know yourselves as, as you know uh, management agents what, do you think that this is a good thing I think there's a potential to be a good thing I think the previous system it was more a case of the name of the country on the player's passport and yeah. I don't think that is the same thing as actually assessing a player's ability and what he's achieved and I think we're on the right lines with this in that a very good player from Argentina has as much right to play in England as a very good player in Italy. And I don't want to get too sort of involved in, in EU law. And I haven't really thought about how it might impact English players because I've been looking outwardly in the markets where I work, like Spain, Argentina, um, and other South American nations. Um, but I, I think it does need fine tuning for sure. And I yeah. think that's understandable because the FA weren't given a lot of time to sort of turn this round. Um, and I think it's quite complicated as well. You know, our job as agents is to work out which players meet the criteria and which don't. Yeah. But as from the presentation, there's yeah. so many different avenues for players to gain points and get themselves to 15. And then we're now hearing that even if they fall short of 15, they might be able to get in anyway if they've got 10, 11, 12. And I'm not sure that helps anyone. I think we need black and white, clear guidelines and everyone knows where they stand. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, you know, it, it, there are going to be teething issues. We've had one window, new rules, um, and as the, and and it's not kind of normal circumstances. We've also had Brexit and COVID. So you pile all of these things on top of each other and it gets quite complex. Um, but but you're absolutely right. We heard anecdotally uh, the other day that, that these kind of um, scenarios do come up where one club was looking at a player and thought, oh, they don't meet the rules, let's move on. And then another club came along and actually actually uh, sign them up. Um, so the exceptions panel are, are, are looking at things very exceptionally at the moment, uh, apparently. Um, so, so that's, you know, it, it does cloud things. Um, so, so yeah, okay, so I can see some, you know, questions coming in thick and fast now. So let's, let's start with Jax, because um, he's been patient and, and asked his question um, some time ago now. Um, so Jack has asked, do you think that this new system will encourage teams in foreign leagues to delay introducing youth players into their first team um, to avoid transfer interest from English clubs? So playing kind of mind games there. Um, but, but what do you think, Charlie? It's a good question. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can't give a definitive answer because I think it will be case by case. Um, from what I've witnessed, certainly domestically, it's something that I've seen before. I can think of a few cases where there've been highly rated players, you know, in the under 18s teams that have been pulled from games on account of the scouts lists that are going to be turning up. So I don't know, for example, if, if you're at a league one side, you've got a very good under 18s player and you see six Premier League teams sending scouts to the game, 
you can try to hide a player because you want to keep hold of him. Internationally, I don't think that's going to be the case because of COVID over the next couple of years. I think if you have assets and they're good enough to be playing regular football, then you need to get them out there. And, and those players are going to be paraded with a view to being sold because the information we're getting from leagues outside of the UK is, is that they're very much selling markets this summer and probably beyond. And the golden goose in terms of transfer fees commanded for these clubs is, is the Premier League. And that, that's where they get you know, the best deals for their players. So, and I think also, you know, you, you're going to have to be 18 to come in as well. So if, if by that stage, if you're good enough to be playing, your club's going to need you playing and they're not going to sit you in the stands. They're an asset. They'll put you out there and then they'll try to control things so as to get the best fee for their player if and when the time comes to sell. Yep, that makes sense. Excellent. So we've got more and more questions here. So we've got one from Daniel, who's Scottish. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about the overseas clubs now, but let's talk about, you know, a little bit closer on our doorstep. So Scottish clubs. Um, Daniel's asking um, that um, Scottish clubs are apparently worrying that Brexit will make it impossible for them to sign players from overseas because they haven't got the same kind of resources. Um, so how justified is, is Daniel's fear or the club's fear um, among uh, Scottish clubs and in fact, the lower league uh, English clubs such as the championship, etc.? cetera. Uh, what's your view on that? I don't think it'll be impossible, but I'm not sure that this actually will, um, will help their cause. Down the years, it has been easier to move players into Scotland um, than it has England. And, you know, we, we have one client, a Colombian striker, national team player called Alfredo Morelos, who's, I think, if he's not the top scorer in Scotland, he's there or thereabouts. And we've been looking to move him to England for a while. We couldn't originally, so we had to move him to Finland. And in the end, he went to Rangers. And I don't think he would have qualified for a work permit for England. And you even historically have seen some leeway for the Welsh clubs that play in the English Football League or Premier League. Um, and I'm, I, from what I understand, that might not carry forward, but there is some optimism among Scottish clubs that they'll still be able to have their own system, which is slightly different from English clubs. And I think that position is unanswered. There's a lot of grey areas still as we get yeah. into regulations. Yeah. But, um, I think there is an argument that they'll be able to retain some of those privileges they had beforehand and might be able to sign players that wouldn't qualify for England. OK. All right. Um, and we've got another question from from Charlie about wages. Um, he asks... Um, or she, um, do you think that certain British players in League One um, and the Championship may be able to demand a higher basic wage than in previous years due to the smaller pool of players that clubs might have been able to sign from Europe? Um, I, I think probably not. I think ordinarily, yes, but I think that will be offset by COVID and the pandemic and the financial pressures of the FL clubs. Um, I think it might middle out a little bit, certainly in terms of transfer fees. It's harder for clubs to, as I said, go to a second division in France, Germany and, and Spain and get a good striker. So maybe if you're a kind of low championship level striker, your value is going to hold because it's not so easy just to go and buy someone else from across the shores. But I think... Um, any professional footballer expecting a big hike in salary in these times is, is maybe a touch unrealistic. And I know I'll be trying to manage some clients' expectations this summer. Yeah. Especially due to COVID. I mean, things are really tightening up. So I think, uh, yeah, maybe if we, we weren't in a COVID world. Um, we've, we've had a number of questions asking more to know more about you, Charlie. So I'm going to I'm going to field some of those questions. So um, they're just asking, how did you get into this? Because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in, in doing what you do. So, um, yeah. So can you just tell us how you kind of got into this role? Um, and also there's a question about how how much how important your language skills have been this is probably the question i get most often and and it's a really difficult one to answer because there's, there's no clear pathway um, to become a football agent and really there are no vacancies in the industry you have to try to sort of 
wriggle your way in. Um, it's something I've always wanted to do because of a passion for football and a bit of sporting history in my family as well. And I think the only advice I can really give is try to think of something that you can offer to an agency um, in addition just to being a good, well-rounded individual. Whatever that may be, it could be a qualification, you know, like law or accountancy, or in my case, languages that might create more opportunities for you as an agent. Um, or invariably, it, these days, it seems to be actually having a relationship with a player that you're confident of bringing into a company. So if you were looking to join an established agency, you know, you might have a friend who's a player that wants you to represent them because we're seeing a lot of new registered intermediaries these days. And that might be enough um, to be taken on. Additionally, I think you need a lot of luck and you need, if you have any contacts, reach out to them. When they don't reply, reach out again and then be prepared to come in and play the long game and, you know, do work experience, be, you know, unpaid for a period of time and, and work your way up that way. Um, but it's, uh, it's really tough. It's, it's a heavily saturated market with, I think, over a thousand registered intermediaries these days. And I think um, you just need to kind of keep going and, and persevere, I suppose. Excellent, good advice. Um, okay, we've got another very interesting question from George. Um, who's asking um, about uh, De Bruyne's choice to not use an agent in his recent contract extension um, and, and using kind of analysts, data analysts to prove his worth. Um, you know, what, what's your view of this? Um, and also what's your view of, of agents who operate in a very public uh, way um, using kind of the press and things like that to, to, to in effect negotiate? I think that's a, that's a really good point. And it was something as an agency we were really excited to see because we have invested heavily in data analytics and stats um, and we actually think we were the first agency to do so and we use those models to help identify good young players coming through but we also use it to support our players case when trying to get them moves or negotiate their contracts um, i can even think of at least one case where we were employed by an elite all-time great Premier League player who wasn't actually our client, but he just wanted to make use of our work with data and analytics to help him in his contract negotiations. And in the end, he actually ended up retiring, but he did make use of our stats department. And this was a couple of years ago. So the Kevin De Bruyne story broke recently, but it's, it's nothing brand new. It's been around for a year or two. And I think it's fantastic but I think it needs to be used alongside having an agent who can go in and negotiate for you because while stats and data and radars and things like that can help support your case, you ultimately need someone to come in and use negotiating power to try and get you the best deal possible. But I think it's a great thing and I think it's something that all players should be doing. Yeah, or well, maybe he read one of those how to negotiate books and thought, give it a go. Um, excellent. So I've seen um, a really good question from Nishat, which I'm really happy about because I was going to kind of close on this question. Um, so um, they say, how would the Super League have changed the nature of your job? Um, and obviously we cannot have a, fo a football discussion without discussing the Super League. So I'm very happy that that, that question has come in. Yeah, I've been asking the same question myself and I, I, I can't say honestly, and it, you know, as you can imagine, it was very difficult to get information out of the big six clubs last week when I think they were just hiding under their desks on Monday and Tuesday. Um, the only real change that there's been a, a, a big, big disconnect between agents and UEFA and FIFA in terms of how they've ha treated our industry, how they deregulated the industry, how they've abolished agents' licenses, reports that they're trying to cap our fees, things like this. And I just wonder whether the European Super League would actually um, result in a brand new governing body that would actually consult and work with agents to try to find a way forward that works for everybody. And maybe that would have been a good thing in the long run. 
But like anyone else, I, I was a firm opponent of, of the plans for the ESL. And who knows, maybe it would have resulted in the same ring fencing that we've seen for clubs, uh, for agents as well. Maybe it would be, you know, only elite established agencies that were allowed to do deals at ESL clubs. And it was a closed market on that front as well. We'll, we'll never know, hopefully. But um, I was against the idea. I think a lot of panic buttons were pressed. You know, a lot of clubs making big losses over the last year or two and maybe a bit of tunnel vision um, overruling them. So I was quite pleased, like most fans, like anyone, that it didn't come to fruition. Absolutely. And, and, you know, watch this space. There's lots of talk of, of, of the clubs being sued for not continuing with their con contracts um, for, the, for the Super League. So, so let's see if this is really dead and buried or not. Um, we have one final question in the Q&A, so we'll take that before we close. Um, and it's from Lee, um, who's got an interesting question about, we've been talking about kind of players coming in, but what about players going the other way? Um, so, so Lee says, um, you know, uh, how difficult is it going to be now? now um, for, for English and or Scottish players um, to, to, to travel and to work in Europe, um, especially for younger players who normally go out there to get first team experience. Mm -hmm. So what's your view of that? I think it's going to be harder. You know, it's something that we weren't really expected. We weren't really expecting, you know, we're so focused on the regulations and criteria to move players in here we're actually forgetting about the impact on players going the other way. So it is a good question. And it, I've slipped up a couple of times. I know speaking to Spanish clubs yeah. in English players that have seen the likes of Jaden Sancho and Jude Bellingham go abroad and do really well and develop quickly, maybe quicker than they would over here. And it's come back at me. They're not, they're not EU players anymore. And some, yeah. it depends on each league. But most of these leagues have got a quota for non-EU players in the case of Spain, I think they're allowed maybe four non-EU players per squad. And as you'd expect, they're normally South Americans, you know, young Brazilians, Argentinians that maybe speak Spanish and are going to come into the first team picture. Now to give up one of those spots to a young English player, it's a big deal for them. And it's certainly sort of bad news for players who want to kind of follow the Bellingham pathway, the Sancho pathway. Um, you know, you're going to have to be very good to win one of those spots. There are some good young players, but it's not going to be easy as it was before. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Um, it's, it, you know, the other leagues do have their own immigration rules. They're not as strict as the UK immigration rules. Um, but as you say, to give up one of these spots is going to be tricky. Um, so probably just for the, the absolute stars of, of, of um, you know, our English and Scottish uh, uh, players. So, um, OK, well, we don't have any more questions, so um, we are finishing right on time. Um, so it just remains me to say thank you so much to Charlie uh, for making the time to, to join us um, uh, this evening. Uh, everything you've said has been really, really interesting. And we've even had comments saying that it's been a fascinating panel discussion. So thank you for that. Um, and of course, I want to say thank you to Madney, my colleague, who was uh, also brilliant and, and did the kind of first half of the presentation. So thank you to both of you. Um, um, and, and just so that our viewers um, are aware, our next session is on financial fair play in football uh, alongside the Lionel Messi of sports law. I wish I had a tag like that. That sounds pretty impressive. Um, and uh, his real name is Nick DeMarco QC. Um, and that's going to be on Thursday, the 13th of May. Um, and we will be sending out invitations to this very shortly. Uh, so thank you again uh, to everyone for joining us um, for this great debate and and um, hopefully we will not be discussing the Super League anytime soon. Thank you everyone. Take care.